name on it you're going to send me the audio video on a thumb drive youtube link email burn it on a disc it's old technology i guess okay not yeah, yeah, that's old technology for you guys. So I should probably start stop mentioning it. But some people still know how to do that. I mean, so on a disc. But you get the email. Yeah, but I don't. I don't like. I don't have the technology. Yeah. So I write about that. Write about really write about that, that in your reflection. No, I am. Yeah, I am. This yeah. Do it. Do it. I literally I'll read it. Up. Bring it. No, stop. Yeah. I'm giving you. Did we talk about this yesterday? Yes. Truman laid an egg. Yeah. With the new deal, the fair deal. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> how many presentations on Thursday in here? You're doing what? What? Malusia. What? The hook, North Korea. Okay, so that's Thursday. Okay, so today, guys, I'm going to get through quite a bit. Tomorrow, Wednesday. We have an extended schedule, so I'm going to hit Korea, the Korean War, in detail, and then I'm going to introduce the Vietnam War for you, okay? Uh, and then Friday, we'll, uh, well, Thursday, we'll have two presentations. I'll do a little bit of teaching when those are done, and then Friday will be mostly civil rights, and then I'll give you a take-home test, optional take-home test, okay, yeah. worth 60 points. Well, yeah, don't turn it in. I mean, you're going to know whether you got the answer right or not. Are you taking it home? You got one of these? Yes. You know what? He's taking 60 points. It's like a big assignment. Essentially, yes? But it's going in as a test. Uh, listen, sister. I, this is total a question, points. not a... No, listen, sister. Okay, listen. This is a total point system. So a point on a video is the same as a point on a test. Point on homework, same as a test. Map quiz, same as a test. I like you for They're that. all the same. That's yeah. That's yeah, that's how I roll. Yeah, because I hated it when teachers did that when I was in school. So why would I do something to you that I didn't like as a student? Um, You're welcome. Okay, moving on to fast history. Okay. Yeah, guys, which party controlled the South? So if you were a member of the Klan, you were probably a registered what? Did I show you these pictures yesterday? All right, guys, I don't, hey, I don't take this lightly, okay? These pictures are part of American history. And this is something that was fairly common in the South in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. In this photograph, you have children smiling. This is ingrained in society that this is okay, this is acceptable. This is not acceptable, this is not okay. In this country, we have a judicial system where people have rights, okay? And there were many states especially in the South, that did not secure those rights for us. 
Harry Truman, as president of the United States, is going to take a big leap forward, okay, in trying to secure people's civil and human rights in this country. He's not going to do it with the help of his own party. He's going to do it with the help of Lincoln's party, which is the Republican Party, okay? Southern Democrats are opposed to much of what Truman is trying to do. What's ironic about it, he's from Missouri. Missouri, remember Kansas, bleeding Kansas, Jayhawkers, border ruffian. Kansas wanted to be a free state. Missouri wanted to be a slave state. Now you got this Missouri president bucking his own party on civil rights. Okay? So if Truman does not receive, in my opinion, the credit he is due as a civil rights president. Because somebody's got to go first. Okay? Now, obviously, Lincoln went first, but... <laughs> In a modern era, okay, anti-lynching, poll tax laws, uh, anti-poll tax laws, better enforced civil rights. Um, he's going to get help from the Republicans uh, at, on his own as, you know, commander in chief, desegregating the military, appointing the first federal judge, uh, black federal judge. And this one is the attorney general of the Justice Department helping blacks with civil rights cases. If Mississippi is not going to secure your civil rights, then the, <clears throat> excuse me. Then the federal government will. Now you guys know me. I'm not a big government guy, right? I'm not in favor of a lot of federal power. This is important. This is a role they need to ensure. <clears throat> <clears throat> so my point here, guys, is we've got a long way to go. This isn't going to change overnight. It's going to take time. It's going to be hard. It's going to be uncomfortable for people. And a lot of people will sacrifice their livelihood and their lives for this movement. Okay. So just kind of getting rolling on that. Okay. With uh, Truman and the Republicans in Congress. Okay. You've all heard of the United Nations. You've all heard of the UN. Yeah. You know much about it? It's just, you know, it's an international organization of over 200 countries. This is part of their charter that was signed by the United States and many other countries in 1945. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail on this, but it's important that you be exposed to it. So let me just read this, okay? Purpose of the United States, maintain international peace and security, suppression of acts of aggression, and so forth. Now, does the United Nations have a military? Do they have an armed forces? Do they have tanks? No, not really. They do have peacekeeping forces that, you know, different countries will lend, but they don't really have any backbone. They can't enforce their decisions. Okay? Now, to develop friendly relations among nations based on self-respect for the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples, to, and to take other appropriate measures to strengthen universal peace. When we signed this in 1945, how were we doing as a nation on equal rights? Not very good. Not good. No. We were an equal opportunity offender. Continuing to achieve the international cooperation, solving international problems of economic, social, cultural, humanitarian character, and promoting and encouraging respect for human rights and for fundamental freedoms without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. Now, as you guys know, the World Cup has been being played in the last few weeks where? Qatar, right? Qatar, whatever. Now, do they have human rights for all of their citizens in Qatar? What about gay people? What about Christians? So, guys, there are many nations that do not follow this. Now, every two years, the United Nations will create what's called the Human Rights Commission of the United Nations. And they will place certain countries on the Human Rights Commission to judge other countries' human rights, abuses, or what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong. Right? So, 
When the United Nations puts China, Cuba, and Saudi Arabia on the Human Rights Commission, it's the height of hypocrisy. It's almost laughable that you would put China on the UN Human Rights Commission. Do you understand what I'm saying? They literally have slavery going on in China right now. In India, there's slavery. In many countries in Africa, they're still using slavery. And these countries get to judge us? Really? Okay, so my point is, guys, do not put your hope in this organization that is going to create world peace or human rights for other people. Okay, now the biggest funding mechanism of this organization in the world, who funds the United Nations more than anybody else? You and I, the American taxpayer, they have no sovereignty over you and I. We don't get to elect them, you understand? So they can't tell us what to do. This is our sovereign law of the land, the United States Constitution. We get to elect our representatives to make decisions for us. These people don't have power over us, you understand? Over my dead body. We do not give up our sovereignty to international organizations, the World Health Organization. We don't, they, we don't take orders from the World Health Organization. We only take orders from our own government that we elect. You understand? Don't buy into this stuff, guys, about a one world like government that's going to create peace on this earth. Okay? Now, I'm a Protestant, so I don't know if you've read Revelation, but, you know, I take it a little more literally than... Catholics do. So, no. No. No one world organizations okay. telling us how to live our lives. No. No. Like I said, over my dead body. And I hope you'll stand with me. Fox? You guys do your own research on the UN. Okay, moving on. Okay. <laughs> Lacey, we divided Germany and Austria up into four sectors, okay? Austria's down here, so it's going to be U.S., British, French, not sure why, and the Russians, okay? By 1955, all troops will be removed from Austria, and they will become a neutral country. Germany, we're going to take these three zones and make one. The Russians will have their zone. Obviously, Berlin is a major issue, okay? Because Berlin has the Western zones, French, British, and American, right here. So in the Western half of this city, they're like an island in a sea of communism. Does that make sense to you? Three million West Berliners, okay, on an island. And we're going to keep that. We're going to make sure those people are okay, okay? Now, remember Churchill, he got defeated in parliamentary elections at the end of the war. Truman feels sorry for him. So he invites him to Missouri to visit Independence, Missouri. And while he's there, there's a graduation ceremony at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri. Okay. Now, guys, I graduated from college in 91. And I remember we had a speaker that came in, gave a commencement address. He was some secretary of something of the state of Georgia. Okay, I graduated from Georgia Southwestern University. Okay. Now, I don't remember who the guy was, but I can tell you what, I would remember it if Winston Churchill showed up to give the commencement address at my college. And then he gives one of the most important speeches of the 20th century at my college in which he says an iron curtain has descended upon the continent of Europe that lie behind that curtain, the ancient capitals of Europe, all under the suppression of a Soviet system. And that the Soviet Union under Stalin has bad intentions. He's warning us that the Russians only fear strength, that if you show them weakness, they will take advantage. This is one of the important lessons we learned in the 20th century, folks. 
that we may have forgotten in the 21st century. As Reagan said it best, peace through strength. If you're the biggest, baddest dude on the block, and you're willing to go to the brink of war to keep peace, you will have peace. If you show weakness, others will seize on that, especially Russia. So last year, guys, we pulled out of Afghanistan after 20 years. And that withdrawal out of Afghanistan was chaotic. We got out of there. We pulled everybody back to the airport in Kabul. What we had fought for for 20 years, the Taliban will take back that country, not in the matter of months, not in the matter of weeks, but in a matter of hours. The country will fall, and we will be completely surrounded at the airport. 13 Americans are going to die in a, in a, a suicide explosion. And we're going to leave hundreds of Americans behind and thousands of Afghans that we promised to take with us, with our tail between our legs. If that doesn't look like weakness, I don't know what does. Three months later, Russia invades the Ukraine. Now, to his credit, President Biden has told the world that we are going to support the Ukraine. We have spent billions and billions of our taxpayer money and billions and billions of dollars more of our weapons to send over there to help them defend their sovereign nation. This sends a message to China because they have motives of Taiwan. They'd like to invade Taiwan. We have said we would defend Taiwan. Okay, And President Biden has said it which I appreciate. But, guys, you show weakness, Churchill, Churchill warned us. He knew. Okay? Stalin's a bad guy. All right. Real quick, guys, uh, we're going to have to punish those that committed war crimes during the war. Okay? So, we talked about the Nuremberg trials in Germany. Nuremberg was the only city with a courthouse still standing large enough to hold an international tribunal. Okay. This is Hermann Goering, uh, the head of the Luftwaffe. He was captured, put on trial for war crimes. He killed himself in his jail cell before he could be convicted. We would execute 10 Nazi leaders for war crimes. More would be sentenced. Most of those sentences were not carried out, the death sentences. Many were punished. For the Japanese, Hideki Tojo will be executed, along with six other Japanese generals for war crimes. We used to have a teacher here. Mrs. Slocum that taught Spanish, and she was mixed race. She was half black, half white. And her grandfather was black. And he was a military police officer at the Nuremberg trial. Okay. And then one of the interviews I got from one of my students a few years ago, her grandfather was the prison guard of the Deki Tojo for six months before they executed him. So he was with Tojo every day for six months. That was a really interesting interview. They became friends. Okay. Kind of crazy. Yeah. I don't think, I don't know, I don't think he spoke to me. So they would have had to have some help to, you know, learn. Okay, allies, okay, so we're going to put together these three zones into one, which will become West Germany eventually. Yeah, yeah. This will become West Germany, this will become East Germany. Of course, you have West Berlin that we still need to talk about, okay? 
Um, now, West Germany is going to come under the European Recovery Program, or what's called the Marshall Plan. Guys, remember after World War One, all those war debts that were owed to us by the Allies, and we said, you need to pay us? Okay? No, not here, guys. We're not going to make them pay their war debts. In fact, we're going to invest $12 billion into Western Europe to help them get back on their feet after four years of war, five years of war, six years of war, actually. Okay? By helping West Western Europe get back on their feet, this is going to in turn help us because exports from the United States will go up 25% to Europe after the war. This is probably one of the best foreign policy decisions we ever made as a nation was the Marshall Plan or the European Recovery Program. Now we offered help to check, you know, the checks, but they didn't, they couldn't come along because Stalin was in control. Okay. So that was really good on our part. The movie or the bit, the little funny video I showed you guys also talked about the Berlin blockade and the airlift. Okay, even though it's a funny little video, it has some good stuff. So this, this right here shows you West Berlin. So what Stalin does is he cut off, he cuts off all the roads, all the railroads, all the canals that lead from the western zone to West Berlin. Those people need food. They need coal. They need clothing. Can you imagine supplying Greater Wichita with a half a million people with all the food we eat by air and all the coal we would need to heat our homes and so forth by air. This is a big freaking deal, guys. The video showed 277,000 flights, mostly by the Americans, but with some help of the British and the French. Now, we, Truman could have sent tanks in with supplies for West Berlin. We would have had World War III. But instead, Truman decides to use civilian aircraft to fly in supplies for 300,000 people, or excuse me, 3 million people. The average daily tonnage was 4,000 tons a day. Now multiply 4,000 times 2,000. Eight million pounds a day. Okay. Now, you see uh, these kids standing off by the runway? There was a pilot named Gail Halverson got the nickname, the candy bomb, okay? When he would fly in and fly out, he saw children watching. So he'd take a little handkerchief, make a little parachute out of it, tie a piece of candy to it. He'd throw it out the window of his airplane every time he took off or landed. And Time Magazine heard about this guy. They wrote a story in Time Magazine. Well, Lifesavers Corporation, and Hershey's Corporation donated tons of candy. So this became known as Operation Little Vittles. And as pilots came and went, they would throw candy out of the windows of their planes. On Easter Sunday, they broke a record. 1,378 flights in the span of 24 hours. Stacking up the planes, flying into West Berlin. Guys, we are going through great lengths to help a people that just three years earlier we were locked in a deadly conflict with. This kind of shows you the American spirit, okay? Like forgiveness and like we want to be friends. We want to help you, okay? So this was, uh, this was a great victory uh, for Truman and for freedom, okay? Combat without an open fight comes the Cold War. Now, Russians could have shut, shot down these planes very easily, but they didn't because that would have been World War III. Okay. 
The guy in charge of the overall airdrop was a guy named Clay. So they took to calling the pilots and their planes Clay's pigeons. You get it, Jackie? Vanessa, you know what a clay pigeon is? Huh? Yes or no? Okay. So some of these country folk around here, they like to shoot guns, shotguns. And so instead of shooting at an animal, you can throw these things that say pull, and it goes up in the air, and you go boom, boom. Those are clay pigeons that you're shooting. They're helpless. These guys. Okay. All right. Milk. The new weapon of democracy. Okay. Now, 1940, May 12th, uh, we set up the government of West Germany. Stalin recognizes defeat, ends the blockade, and then he sets up the government of East Germany. Guys, West Germany would not be a sovereign nation until 1955. We will control West Germany for 10 years after the war. Okay? Now, whoever made this map is definitely geographically challenged. <laughs> like some of you. Anybody see what's wrong with this map? This would be former West Germany. This would be former East Germany. Santa Barbara, California. <laughs> nice map, Magellan. Okay. California. Yeah, California. <clears throat> okay, NATO. You've all heard of it. I've talked about it. North Atlantic, not North American, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. This is something we've never done before. This is what George Washington warned us never to do was get into a peacetime military alliance. The problem with NATO, guys, is one for all, all for one. So if one of these countries is attacked, all nations go to war. But our Constitution says only who can declare war. Only Congress can declare war. So guys, today, if Russia were to bomb Poland today, we're going to war. We don't have a choice. When we were hit on 9-11, every NATO country sent troops to Afghanistan. NATO has only been employed a couple of times in 70 years. Okay? That means, guess what? It's working. There has been no third world war. So I think if George Washington came back today and said, this NATO thing, you know, it's actually worked pretty good. That was a good idea, people. Nice job. Thanks, George. Okay. <laughs> so the Senate approves this 82 to 13. Who better to put in charge of NATO than Eisenhower? Okay. The headquarters would originate in Paris, but who is the real backbone of NATO? We are. So countries want to join NATO for protection. You understand? From who? Russia. Okay. Now, Paris, the French got tired of kind of being the boss. So they asked that we move the headquarters out of Paris. So NATO headquarters today is still in Europe, but where? No. Nope. Brussels, which is where? Okay. Now, this is a Turkish F-16 fighter bomb. Where is this plane built? built in the United States by American workers, and they paid us for it. Is that good for our economy? 
Yeah, I mean, that's what the world needs, is more fire bombs. The Turks don't make their own, so either we're going to sell it to them, or the British are going to sell them to them, or the French, because not all countries make these planes. You got to use the restroom? Yeah. I thought you had a question. I don't. No, nothing to question here? Okay, how moving many, on. Go how pee. How many people can fit in there? Two. One. Yeah, that's a one-man job. Right Got it. There. There's my All right. Okay, so this is important. 1949, there were 15 countries. All for one, one for all. U.S. and Canada, and then these dark blue countries. Okay? In 1952, the video talked about it. The Truman Doctrine says this, we must assist free people to carry out their own destinies in their own way. The freaking Russians were meddling in Greece and Turkey trying to get communism to take over down there. And we stepped in, Truman said, hey, I got $5.2 billion that we're going to help you with. So you need to come join us. And so Greece and Turkey said, yeah, we'll join you. Okay. So they joined NATO, and by this time, guys, we have built not the super fortress, not the flying fortress, but the strata fortress, which is the what? The B-52. The B-52 bomber has one major mission, to carry a payload of what? Atomic bombs or later hydrogen bombs. Now, if we put a B-52 strata fortress in Turkey, which we do, the only way to deliver an atomic bomb in the 50s is by a plane. To Moscow. This scared the crap out of the Russians. That we had B-52s in Turkey. Yeah. Uh, I can probably make it back to, like, Norway or something. Yeah. Now, 1955, West Germany becomes part of NATO. Then we got to wait till 1982, and this is a huge addition to NATO, of course. Spain. And the military power that is Spain. Kidding. Okay. Then, guys. 1989, the Berlin Wall comes down. Soviet Union collapses. Winning. Right? 1990, East Germany, part of NATO. That's ours, boys. Okay? Then, 1999, Poland, Czech Republic, and Hungary. Winning. So those countries that were under the Soviet bloc for 40 years are now in our alliance. Fast forward to what, 90, uh, 99, 90, or 2004, we're going to add these three. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. These people have been dealing with Russian incursions for centuries. No more. That's over. Those days are over. You attack Estonia, guys. You're attacking the United States of America. And you can add to that Romania, Bulgaria, Slovo Slovenia, and Slovakia. Guys, our relations with Russia after communism collapsed actually got pretty good. You had Mikhail Gorbachev and then a guy named Boris Yeltsin. Boris Yeltsin comes to the White House to visit President Clinton in the 90s. They're, they're throwing back vodka shots and slapping each other on the back, giggling and smiling with each other, having a grand old time. President of Russia and the President of the United States. For a while, they were calling NATO, NATO for two years they were calling NATO, NATO plus Russia. We won. The whole reason for NATO was Russia. Then, started to expand NATO more. Now, 
New NATO members, 2009, Croatia, Albania, under consideration, Macedonia, Georgia, and yes, the Ukraine. This is where Putin says, ah, 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 ah. no, no, Ukraine is not going to join NATO. This is a threat to the sovereignty of the, Ru of the Russian people. And he started meddling in their affairs. Before they invaded recently, they had troops on that border for years. They were meddling in the affairs of Ukraine, assassinations, stuff like that. Like, and guys, Ukraine is one of the most corrupt nations on the planet. Okay, so they're trying to buy people off, they're killing people. It, you know, it's, it's an ugly situation. In 2014, the Soviet Union sent troops into Crimea, this peninsula here, and took it back during the Obama administration. Nothing happened. Not that I'm saying we're going to war for that. They're not part of NATO. Okay? The fact is, Russia said, dude, you keep expanding our direction, you're going to have a problem. Okay? And they chose, you know, after what happened in Afghanistan, our withdrawal there, they chose that time. They said, this is, this is the opportunity we've been waiting for. Okay. And so here we are. Georgia, they invaded there too. Russians did. Okay. So I think we're about to add two countries. Yeah. There's a process to see what the impact of it will be globally and so forth. So right now, there's two nations. We didn't ask to join. They asked to join after the invasion of the Ukraine. You guys know which two countries? Sweden and Finland. Finland. They've asked to join NATO. You guys, Sweden has been neutral for a long time. But after what the Russians are doing in the Ukraine, they're like, you know what? We want America. We want the United States on our side. Okay. Yeah. I think they'll I think they'll get approved. Okay. So guys, you know, we could crush Russia, but but they have what? They have hydrogen bombs with delivery systems that can hit Wichita, Kansas. Absolutely. Who wants to play that game? I'm good. You know what? I lived through the Cold War. I don't really need another one. You know what I mean? And Wichita, guys, we're targeting. We got all the, the refueling tankers here at McConnell. All the aircraft industry. You want to take out the enemy's industry, right? You live on the south side? Who would they take out first if they did it that way? Like what? Well, I mean, DC. Huh? Yeah, then you got to go to Colorado where we have the Air Force Academy and all the stuff up there we have up in Colorado. Um, naval bases. Yeah. Yeah, we used to do this, guys, when, we, when I was growing up. You know what I mean? Like, I lived in Pensacola, Florida. Like, dude, we're going to get hit. It's a naval base. Okay. We're going to be one of the first. You know, hopefully it'll be painless. <laughs> <laughs> but if you live if you live on the north side of Wichita, like I do, they're going to be hitting the south side of Wichita. You know what I mean? For all the manufacturing, the air bases. Okay, so depending on how big it is, depending on where you live, Trail, you guys live south of, of Kellogg, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anybody else live south of Kellogg? Yeah. Nice knowing you. Okay. Now, we're, now, you people that are north, we're the ones that are going to suffer. Yeah. Why? 
Radiation, radioactive fallout. Well, at least we're alive. Yeah, for now. Yeah. So the hydrogen bomb, which I'm about to introduce to you. They bomb that one place. Carol will be affected. Like, is it that far? Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, we would we wouldn't like perish, uh, but there would probably be a lot of damage. How far does like the radiation go? Well, the radiation goes up into the mushroom cloud. So whatever falls out from there, which way the wind's blowing? So it's going south. Today, it's out of the south. Tomorrow, it's out of the north. Getting cold. You guys see the forecast? Yeah. yeah it's it's to Make sure you get your stuff, your warm stuff out. All right. Hey, we got to keep that going. Is it going to snow? Okay. Huh? No. What time we get out? 45? Yeah. All right. Let's go. All right. So, uh, guys, the Korean War starts June 25th, 1950. Okay, it's not actually a war, it's a conflict. They call it the Korean conflict, but let's call it what it was. It was a war, okay? Now, uh, that's 1950. In 1952, I'm going to do the Korean War tomorrow, okay? Uh, Eisenhower's running for president. Now, Eisenhower, who's an American hero, both parties asked him to run for president under their party. Nobody knew whether he was a Republican or a Democrat, okay? In fact, when he was president, you probably wouldn't even know what he was because he was so freaking moderate, okay? He was in the middle, all right? And so Eisenhower chose the Republican Party, and the American people chose him. First Republican in 20 years, the GOP means grand old party, okay? Republican Party. Now, he made a campaign promise of ending the conflict in Korea. So when a World War II general hero goes to Korea a month after he's elected, and threatens nuclear war against North Korea and China if they don't do a ceasefire, he gets a ceasefire. Okay, that ceasefire takes place in July of 1953. Okay, that's 69 years ago. That's it. There's been no formal peace agreement, just a ceasefire. Is my math wrong? No. <laughs> so, in those 69 years, guys, we have had between 10 and 25,000 American troops on the border of North Korea. Here, this is the 38th parallel that separates the North and the South. We have had between 10 and 25,000 troops on this border for the last 69 years. Okay, there has been no formal peace agreement. Now, Tomorrow, I will get in and talk about a lot of the Korean War. I'm going to go into some detail, tell you some stories, and so forth, okay? Uh, and you'll, you'll have a good understanding of what's called the Forgotten War. It's the last black and white war. So the pictures are in black and white. The video coverage is in black and white. We don't win, so people want to forget it. There's no celebration. In World War II, if you went in at 18... And you were sent to North Africa, then you went to Britain, then you came across the English Channel into France, and then you went all the way to Germany, and then we won. You were in the military for four years. You were gone for four years. In Korea, we do 12 months in or 12 months in country, and then you rotate out, and new people come in. Follow me? We did the same thing in Vietnam. We do the same thing in Iraq, Afghanistan. You go 12 months, then you come out, you go back in, you come out, so forth. Okay? So when you talk to people that served in Afghanistan, they served, some people say, well, I served, you know, two tours, or I did four tours, or I did six tours. Okay? Those people, like, they know what it's like to live in a combat zone. Okay? Like, for a long period of time. So, guys, uh, this war is different than any one we've ever fought before, and it is really cold in the north, in the mountains, okay? And I'll talk about that tomorrow, okay? And then I will also introduce um, 
the Vietnam conflict as well. Okay, so Secretary of State under Eisenhower is John Foster Dulles. He was in a picture I showed you of uh, Roosevelt on Inauguration Day in 1945 with Truman. Dulles was the other guy. Okay. Um, he was very well qualified for this job. Okay. He's going to lead the new policy. Now, Eisenhower's a military guy, right? He wants to downsize the military. God bless Eisenhower. He was a straight shooter, man. Now, we're going to focus on atomic weapons. We don't need as many standing troops. We don't need a huge army. Okay, because we have these weapons. Now, in 1952, we are going to detonate the Earth's first ever hydrogen bomb. This is a fusion bomb, colliding of atoms. This bomb is really 1,000 times more powerful than what we dropped on Japan. This thing is massive. In the South Pacific, we detonated it where there was an island. an island that is no longer there. This is Operation Ivy Mike, okay? Following year, the Russians will have a hydrogen bomb. Again, Soviet spies will give those secrets away. Now, I used to have some students that rolled through here, last name Hagen. There were three of them, two girls and a boy. And whenever their kids were in my class, their grandpa, contacted me and said he wanted to come talk to the class. And I'm like, you bet. Because he was a World War II fighter pilot. And he had a story. He was shot down twice in World War II, survived. The second time he was shot down in World War II was during the Battle of the Bulge. Where he crash landed, the American lines were about 150 yards that direction. The German lines were about a half mile in that direction. When he crash landed, he broke his ribs. And so as he's trying to get out of his plane, he can see the Americans. He's waving at them to come help him. And they're waving at him to come to him, come to them. He's like, and they got trucks. Why don't they just drive over here and get me? They won't. So he gets out of his plane, starts walking. Finally gets over to him. He's like, what the heck, guys? You saw me crash. Why don't you come get me? Like, man, we are really sorry. You couldn't. You just walked to a minefield. So he survived that. Okay. Then he stays in the military. Okay. After the war. And in 1952, he was given the task of flying through this mushroom cloud at 40,000 feet to gather samples the military, gather air samples from the mushroom cloud. We'd never detonated one of these before. So we needed to know what was inside that cloud. So he starts to tear up at this point. He, he says, yeah, me and my wingman went in to the cloud. And only I came out. He said the other plane was never, pilot never heard from, seen again. They don't know what happened. But he survived that, flying through that mushroom cloud at 40,000 feet. And then he left the military. He went to work for Cessna. The Cessna builds new planes every so often. And somebody's got to test them out to see if they work. You know, we build a new plane. Who wants to volunteer to see if it flies? We volunteer. So he does that. He's a first test pilot, okay? He's flying out uh, in a Cessna over Goddard. This is in the 60s, so Goddard's not as big as it was. Or it is now. And so he's flying a Cessna and the plane malfunctions. And so he ejects from the aircraft. And the cockpit camera, he brought a picture. The cockpit camera was taking pictures the whole time as the plane's falling out of the sky. And he's parachuting down. And he brought a picture of his parachute taken from the cockpit camera as the plane was falling out of the sky. He survived that too. Dude had like nine lives, right? <laughs> Amazing stories this guy has. Guy, his name was Hagen. I'm sure he's passed away by now, but uh, really cool. That that's those stories really stuck with me. So Eisenhower and Gullis are going to have this this idea of brinkmanship that we will go to the brink of war to keep peace. Okay, 
that we will threaten massive retaliation against Russia or China if they threaten our ally. Okay, and so that is the foreign policy moving forward that scares the crap out of people because when you go to the brink of war, and we're talking about nuclear weapons here, that's scary. Okay, so tomorrow I'm going to get into the Korean War here, okay, and then also introduce you to the Vietnam War. Now, prior to World War II, Vietnam, which is here, Laos and Cambodia were all part of French Indochina, okay? Remember, the Japanese, during World War II, controlled this peninsula, controlled large parts of China, they controlled French Indochina, Thailand, Burma, Indonesia, most of it down here. So when the Japanese are defeated in World War II, they got to go home. They got to leave all these places. And what that creates is a vacuum. Who's going to take over? In Vietnam, is it going to be the French? Are the French going to take back over the colonial? entity. Some in Vietnam want the French to come back. Some don't. In Korea, it's different because the Russians sent troops into North Korea. We sent troops into South Korea. Then we're going to bo both leave and have free and fair elections, right? Free and fair elections. That doesn't happen. And then in China in 1949, you've got a civil war between communists, Mao Zedong, and Chiang Kai-shek. Remember that guy, Chiang Kai-shek, who was our friend? you got a war going on in China. The communists win there in 49, and Chiang Kai-shek flees to Taiwan. Okay? And since then, Taiwan has called itself independent of China. China wants it back, okay? So that's the problem, guys. These communists want to take over in these places. And guys, after what we saw happen in Eastern Europe, we're like, no, 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 no. We're going to contain communism where it is and not allow it to expand. So the policy in the United States is containment, to contain communism from spreading. Okay, and that is going to lead to two hot wars in Korea and Vietnam, 50 to 53, 64 to 75 for the Vietnam war. Okay, good. That's coming to mark. Okay, that wasn't too fast. 